So, I know I'll forget this, so I'll say it now. If you can, before next week, read chapter 6 of St. John's Gospel. Okay, so that'll tie in with the Eucharist. And if you read that ahead of time, we'll probably be able to go through it a little bit more rapidly and that way get back on track. So John chapter 6. Very beautiful passage. And just think about the words. Pray about the words. Now, with that, tonight we begin sacraments. So we've already talked about the creed. So pretty much we've done from who is God, have gone all the way through Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Church, Mary and the Saints, Heaven, Hell, Purgatory. So pretty much the creed we've covered. Now we move really to the second second section of the Catechism, which is the sacraments. So think back. Remember we talked about Jesus and how Jesus is priest, prophet, and king. And as priest, he sanctifies. As prophet, he teaches. As king, he shepherds or, you could say, rules. Either way. What Jesus did continues on through the ministry of the church. That's what we talked about. So the church takes on those same three roles. So church is priest, prophet, and king. Church is called to sanctify to teach, and to also rule and guide. Well, we're going to look at the idea of sanctification now. So, specifically, we're looking at the sacraments. So, how does Christ continue to share the life of the Holy Trinity with us? How do we share in what he did on this earth? It is through sacraments. So here we see the action of Christ continuing on through the ministry of the church and it is through, therefore, these sacraments that we are brought into the life of the Holy Trinity. Okay, little triangle, equilateral triangles always for Trinity. Now, with that then, we just look at the basic definition of a sacrament. Now, in itself, in scripture, we find two words. One is a Greek word, which would be musterion in Greek, but we could just simply say mystery. And the other word is sacramentum, which is a Latin word, which we call sacrament. Now, so this would be the Greek version, and this would be the Latin version. Now, on the eastern side of Christianity, when we think of the Orthodox churches or our Eastern Rite Catholic churches, they would still use mystery. Even in our own liturgy, we'll talk about as we gather to celebrate these sacred mysteries. The idea of mystery here, of course, is not like Agatha Christie mystery, but rather the idea of there's something visible, something presented to us, something that's been made known to us, but has a meaning greater than all of that. There's a mystery to it because, of course, we're dealing with God, something of God. So there's always going to be something of a mystery, something beyond the total comprehension that we have, something beyond this natural time and space that we're bound by. Sacrament is really more tangible. This is something we find in the western side of the church, the Latin speaking side. And actually it was a Roman term that really meant like a sign, really a visible sign. Like the Roman soldiers had visible signs of who they were. So these, and it was called a sacramentum. And so the church used that word to try to convey these are these outward signs that God, that Christ has given to us through which he gives grace. So either word. But we technically use the word sacrament. So a sacrament is an outward sign instituted by Christ, so instituted 
by Christ to give grace. Now, what we need to do is break down the definition. When we're talking about an outward sign, we're talking about something visible. The sign value has two parts. One is matter and one is form. Now, we'll use as a basic, I guess, a basic example, baptism, because that's the first sacrament. So in baptism, the matter, the physical part of that sacrament, and the action part. So this would be the physical action part of the sacrament. Would be the immersion of the person or the pouring of water of that over that person. And so either the immersion in water or the pouring of water over that person. Now, the sign value of this, so the symbolism of this matter is important. Because when we think of water, for instance, we think of something we need for our health. Without water, we die. Or something that washes and cleanses. So that's two very basic ideas of, or symbols of water. But in scripture, we also find how God parted the waters to bring about life in Genesis, that with water God wiped away evil at the time of Noah's Ark and restarted creation. In the Exodus account, Moses, by the power of God, parted the waters of the Red Sea and led Israel from slavery in Egypt to the Promised Land. So all of that symbolism is part of this water. But with Christ, too, we remember how he was baptized by water. One caution there, that remember that baptism scene that we read when we were talking about Jesus, when John the Baptist baptizes him, that is not our understanding of baptism because ours deals with passion, death, and resurrection. So just to clarify that. But the idea that John the Baptist, this idea of a Jewish ritual washing using water is part of the symbolism to this cleansing of our soul. Now the form is, as Jesus taught the apostles, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So we're baptized in the name of the Holy Trinity. So this is the sign value of that sacrament. In looking at this too, that the minister of the sacrament is the person who performs it. So normally in baptism it's a priest, could be a deacon, but normally a priest. In an emergency anyone can baptize. So in an emergency. So like my mom, who used to be an operating room nurse way back when, at times worked in the delivery department, and a couple of times she baptized babies. So anyone in an emergency can baptize, and it is a valid baptism. As long as you pour water and you say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And so, that's the minister. Now, the minister has to have the intention, meaning that he has to want to do what the church wants. So that's the idea. So that if I do a baptism, and even if I have the worst headache on earth, if I'm doing it, and my intention is to do what the church asks, then that baptism is valid. So that's a valid baptism. Now the person who receives, so the recipient, has to have a disposition of faith. That that person wants to be, receive the sacrament. So the person wants, you can't force it. Now at this point, some people will say concerning baptism, well what about little babies? Well, one has to remember, first of all, in history, we've always had 
babies being baptized. So even in Acts of the Apostles, it speaks of how the apostles baptized whole households. So whole households, whole families, could be everything from the little ones to the big ones. But then, too, Jesus said to the children, or to the apostles, let the children come to me. So Jesus welcomed children. He wanted to share his life with them. That's an important gospel passage because Jewish rabbis generally did not deal with children. Children were seen and not heard. Moms took care of children. Rabbis did not. But the fact that Jesus says, let the children come to me, shows that he wanted them to receive his life. You think of a little three-year-old. How much is a little three-year-old going to understand anything? But Jesus wanted to share his life with them. Moreover, we have to think that you know, babies aren't dumb. We think about it. When babies are born, they can recognize the voice of mom and dad, especially mom. And so babies know. So even though a baby may not be able to articulate the vows of baptism, nevertheless, wouldn't that baby, who's given life by God, made in God's image and likeness, want to receive that beautiful grace? So anyway, so that's the recipient. The recipient has to have faith. But if you're an adult, and if somebody ties you up, takes you down to the Potomac River and baptizes you, and you're screaming, no, 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 it's not going to work because you're an adult. So hopefully we wouldn't do that to a baby either. But anyway, so baby, it's the idea of the parents bringing the child, presenting the child to God. The child is baptized. There is the faith necessary. Now, we say that these are also instituted by Christ. So Jesus himself gave us these seven sacraments. So these are actions that he either did or told his apostles to do. By saying that, we find that Jesus did not baptize, but he told the apostles at the time of the ascension, you go out, preach the gospel, and baptize. Jesus, though, did tell the apostles to do some things, like at the Last Supper, at the Holy Eucharist. He said, do this in remembrance of me. At the night of the resurrection, he said, receive the Holy Spirit. What sins you forgive, they are forgiven. So these are seven sacraments that Jesus either did himself or told the apostles to do. So they're instituted by Christ. Now it's always been interesting, why seven? Okay, so when we think about this number, well, we start with baptism, okay, which is then followed by, in the normal chronology of how we receive them, by penance, and then we have Holy Eucharist, confirmation marriage holy orders and anointing of the sick now these are seven sacraments when we think about seven God created over a period of seven days in Genesis. For the Jews, seven was the perfect number. Seven was a sign of the covenant. So, perhaps, we don't know for sure. But it's a good spiritual speculation to say, well, Christ gave us these seven sacraments because through his passion, death, and resurrection, we're called to be a new creation. That through these sacraments, we become that new creation. We live that life of grace. And so these sacraments really cover from birth to death. Not that we receive all of them, but beginning with birth to death. It's one life with the Lord. So perhaps that's the reason why. Now, in looking at these sacraments, some of them are the fundamental sacraments. So when we think of baptism, Holy Eucharist, 
and confirmation. These are called the sacraments of initiation. So the sacraments by which a person becomes a full member of the church. For instance, at the Easter Vigil, if somebody were not baptized who wants to become a member of the church, that person would be baptized and confirmed and then receive Holy Eucharist. Penance would come later because baptism washes away all sin. Baptism is like a whole new birth. It's wonderful when you think about it, especially if you're an adult. Everything's washed away in baptism. Really clean slate. So no matter what you've done, it's all washed away. Not bad. So, now, so these are what are called the three sacraments of initiation. In the very early church, and also to this day in the Orthodox churches, and some of our Eastern Catholic churches, these three will be given all at once. So a baby would be baptized, then immediately confirmed, and then even receive Holy Communion. In the western side of the church, we've generally split these so that there can be a time for catechesis and maturity. So that after baptism, a child matures, is able to learn the faith, then would receive Holy Communion, then confirmation. So normally, in our church, infancy, and then Holy Communion is usually around second grade, and then confirmation, usually around ninth grade, somewhere along those lines. Penance, of course, in the normal course, would precede Holy Eucharist. But again, as far as what makes you a full-fledged member of the church, it's baptism, Holy Eucharist, and confirmation. Because what if, let's say a person had never been baptized, was dying, wanted to be baptized? Well, that person would receive these three sacraments and that those are the three key sacraments for becoming a full member of the church. A dying person would not go to penance, most likely. And then two, not everybody gets married and not everyone's going to become a priest. And then hopefully we all are anointed before we die, but who knows, right? So, God willing. Now, there are also some sacraments that leave a permanent mark on our soul. So they're so special that they leave the seal, and that's what is part of this term sacrament, that we're marked. So like with baptism, we receive this character. So put a little C there. This, once we've got it, we've got it. We'll never be re-baptized. So sacrament of baptism is one shot. It leaves that permanent, fundamental mark on our soul. Same thing with confirmation. Once a person has it, you got it. And then also with holy orders. Once ordained, ordained. These other sacraments, you could receive more than once, like penance, many times. Holy Eucharist, many times. Marriage, well, if your spouse dies, you could receive that more than once. And anointing of the sick, you could receive that. But these three Baptism, confirmation, holy orders, they are they one shot, permanent, put a mark on our soul kinds of sacraments. Now, with that, each sacrament gives grace. Grace is a supernatural gift from God. So it's nothing of this natural world. A supernatural gift from God for sanctification, Okay, so to make us holy, and salvation, to bring us in union with God. So for sanctification and salvation. Grace is simply a sharing in the life and love of God, the Holy Trinity. We could look at it as almost like the breath of God, God breathing life into us. You know, it's like a person is like resuscitated. You know, if you do CPR, you breathe into the person. Well, it's sort of like what grace is. It's like God breathing his life, his love into us. That's what really grace is. Now, we do receive three kinds of graces in these sacraments. One is called sanctifying, 
also actual, and then also sacramental. Sanctifying grace is simply that indwelling presence of the life of the Holy Trinity. That's all sanctifying grace is. That is that indwelling presence of the life of the Holy Trinity in our soul. This first sanctifying grace is given at baptism. So baptism is always seen sort of like that death and resurrection. So it's like God is breathing that life into us. And it's going to dwell there so that we really are present. God is present in our own souls. This was really symbolically captured, especially in the early church. In the early church, if we look at the documents, the norm oftentimes was immersion. And they would want to have immersion, and the person, after professing faith, was stripped naked for the baptism. And because it's like you know, a child coming out of the womb, in a sense. So, but the person was to be immersed in cold water, like really cold, and also what they called living water, so like lake or a river. And the idea was that the priest would say, I baptize you in the name of the Father. Boom. Wait for the last bubbles. And then the person would come up. What would happen? <gasps> right? So it's the idea of the grace, this new life, and of the Son. Boom. To the last bubbles. Then up. <gasps> and then of the Holy Spirit. Boom. And then up you go. So really, the symbolism behind the sacrament was really like a death and resurrection. Like a, a rebirth from the womb of the mother. So... This sanctifying grace, again, is that presence of the life and love of God in us. It's a beautiful notion. And sanctifying grace is intensified. You know, we don't want to just quantify it, you know, like we keep getting more and more and more. But it's really like the, the quality gets stronger as we receive the other sacraments and we receive the grace or the or we study the faith as we live our life with the Lord, that grace gets stronger, more intense. Actual grace focuses on action. So each sacrament does give us actual graces to act, to live the faith. So actual grace enlightens the mind and strengthens the will to know right from wrong, to know good from evil, and then to choose what is good. So the actual grace comes to help us. Beyond sacraments, though, we could probably think in our lives how God gives us actual grace. Like, we all go through times of confusion or doubt, and we'll pray. We'll say, you know, like, Lord, you know, I need, need an answer. I need some kind of direction in this. And all of a sudden, the light goes on. That's actual grace. Or maybe we're facing a temptation of some kind. And it's like, you know, Lord, I've got to get past this temptation. You know, help me. And like, boom. That's actual grace. God's giving us the strength we need. Sacramental grace is that particular grace that comes from each sacrament. So each sacrament gives us its own special graces. So baptism has it, its own. But for instance, like marriage, a couple receives the graces to live those vows in holy orders. A priest receives those graces to be a priest. So each sacrament gives us three kinds of grace, sanctifying, actual, sacramental. All right, any questions so far? So far, so good? Very good. All right, well, back to baptism then. So we've covered that baptism is the pouring of water or immersion in water. And the priest says, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The minister is normally a priest. 
could be a deacon, in an emergency, anybody. The recipient has to have some kind of faith. But what does baptism do? So, the effects of baptism. Well, number one is, washes away original sin and infuses sanctifying grace into our soul. So it's like the hand of God comes out to touch a child's soul or anybody's soul and really cleanses that original sin and any sin. So I mentioned it as an adult everything's washed away. So if there's any sin, it's like a total rebirth. So the hand of God reaches out to wash away that sin and fill that soul with his divine life. Again, I like to look at it as like that resuscitation that you know, just a person resuscitates somebody. God is breathing life into us. And then secondly, then the, the person truly becomes a child of God, okay, which is very important. Sometimes we use the term the adoption. We've been adopted. So God makes us his own. Yes, we're creatures, but now because of the faith and the grace, it's like God adopts us as his own. We become a child of God. We become a member of the church. Now here, of course, this has a little particularity to it because if a person is baptized as a Catholic, that person becomes part of the Catholic Church. A person's baptized as a Lutheran, a person becomes part of the Lutheran Church. So there is that communal dimension. Baptism isn't simply an individualistic sacrament. It binds us to a family. So when we're brought to a church and baptized in that church, we're adopted, yes, as a child of God, but we also become part of a church, a family. So there's a particularity to all of this. Again, it's not an individualistic sacrament. A person cannot say, well, I want to be baptized but not belong to the church. Makes no sense. And even when we think about who Christ is, Christ came to found a church. So that baptism does bring us into the life of the Trinity, but also into the life of a church. Then too, baptism allows us to share in the saving mystery of our Lord's passion, death, and resurrection. So the saving mystery of Christ. So what Christ did for us is continued on through baptism. Well, I just lost my marker. Thank you. <laughs> so, now, in looking at this, the saving mystery of Christ, you know, we th when we think of that, we say, well, Jesus died to forgive our sins. Well, how? Because we weren't there, right? So Jesus died in the year 33. So if we say Jesus died to forgive our sins, how? Well, it's, that's why we have sacraments. They're if, ever living signs. Christ continues his work through the ministry of the church, through these sacraments. So yes, in that timeless way, what Christ did is shared with us through these sacraments beginning with baptism. Now, any questions so far? You all are very easy tonight. Yes? Quick question. As you, as you march through the sacraments from the birth to mm -hmm. first communion to confirmation, marriage, mm -hmm. first is um, the last rite part of anointing. It would be, yeah. But anointing of the sick. Could, is broader than just last rites. So like if a person were having major surgery, 
that person could be anointed. So the idea would be that anointing of the sick confers graces of healing and strengthening. So even though in a very, I guess, traditional or popular way it's associated with last rites, it's broader than that. Okay. All right, now, so baptism is the fundamental sacrament. Now, what about a person who dies without baptism? So there's two special cases here. So our normal sacramental baptism is by water and the invocation of the Holy Trinity. That's the normal baptism. But we also have what's called baptism by blood and also baptism by desire. So in the very early church when the Romans were persecuting the church the Romans would arrest not only those who were Christians but those who were studying preparing for baptism. They didn't make any distinction and those people would also be brought to trial and given the choice of offering sacrifice to the pagan gods or dying. And many chose to die. Well the early church thought well that profession of faith and their shedding of their blood that martyrdom was really a baptism by blood. They, sh they really demonstrated that. So even though they didn't have the official sacramental baptism, they did so by their blood. And then baptism by desire, that if a person desires baptism, but for some reason cannot have that physical, that sacramental baptism, but there is that desire, that too is considered a baptism. That's sort of linked with that desire of the early martyrs of the church, some of them who weren't officially baptized but gave their lives, but the desire. And that desire is even extended to, at least in, say, theological speculation to babies who may die without baptism. You know, granted, we want to baptize babies as soon as possible because that is a sure means of the graced life. But what happens if by chance a baby dies because of, you know, what is it, the infant, was it infant death, it's it, SIDS, right? Sudden, what, death. sudden death, sudden infant death syndrome, SIDS. So, you know, it's no fault of the baby. It's the desire of God, the church, the parents, you'd say the baby himself. So even though there isn't that normal, regular baptism, there could be that desire. Nevertheless, as soon as possible, parents should have children baptized. It always sort of troubles me when parents wait like a year or something, because you never know what's going to happen, right? And Jesus did say that the surest means is baptism. So, but anyway, we leave all that to the mercy of God. All right, any other questions about baptism? Mm, nope. All right, well, that's, that's easy enough. Then we're moving right along here. Next, then the next sacrament, which is linked with baptism, is confirmation. As I mentioned in the very early church, these two were done together. So a person was baptized and then confirmed. Like St. Paul speaks about how he baptized somebody, and then he laid hands and conferred the Holy Spirit. So, distinct sacraments, but linked together. Again, in the Western Church, we separated them, tad for catechesis, but nevertheless, they are very much linked together. Now, with confirmation, as far as the matter and form. So moving to confirmation here. Matter and form. The matter would be the anointing 
with holy chrism. So the bishop, oh, I'll explain that all together. The, the normal minister of the sacrament is a bishop, although by permission a priest can also confirm. So like if it was an emergency, somebody who's dying, or in the case of an adult at the Easter vigil who's, being bap who's coming into the church, maybe being baptized also, I have delegation to confirm. So, but normally it's the bishop of the diocese who confirms. So the bishop would place his hand on the confirmandi, so the person who's going to be confirmed, and he then makes the sign of the cross with holy chrism, and he says, be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, chrism is a very special oil. It's an oil that goes back to the Old Testament times. So it's olive oil that's mixed with balsam. It's a perfume. So in the Old Testament times, this oil was used to anoint the priests, prophets, and kings of the Jewish people, showing that God had called that person to a very special role of leadership and would empower that person with the grace to fulfill the role. We use chrism because through confirmation, we're sharing fully in the ministry of Christ. And Christ is priest, prophet, and king. So we too are called to sanctify, to teach, and to lead others in the faith. Moreover, just like oil, like on clothing, leaves a permanent mark, a stain, the idea of the anointing with the holy chrism shows we're marked. There's a permanent mark on our soul. Again, that idea of the character sacrament. So, the anointing with holy chrism, the form is be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And normally, it's the bishop, but again, special circumstances, a priest can also confirm. Now, confirmation strengthens our baptismal promises. That's one thing. But confirmation also gives us the fullness of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. So, seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. And these are the gifts that Isaiah prophesied that the Messiah would pour forth. These are the gifts that came upon the apostles at Pentecost. So, seven special gifts. The way to the easiest way for, to remember them is the way I do, which I'll explain. But <laughs> it's fear of the Lord, followed by piety, then knowledge, understanding, Counsel, wisdom, and fortitude. These are the seven gifts. Very beautiful gifts. So let's just think about this. So in baptism, a person becomes a child of God, receives that graced life, becomes a member of the church shares in the whole saving ministry of our Lord. Now, a confirmation, all of that is renewed and strengthened, but also now these seven special gifts are given so that a person can fully share in the ministry of Christ. Remember, it was a couple weeks ago, spoke about the idea of the common priesthood. All of us share in the work of Christ in different ways, of course. My role is different from your role. But nevertheless, all of us are called to share in the work of Christ. These seven gifts help us. Now, fear of the Lord is the fundamental gift. It is recognizing God is God. So fear of the Lord isn't this you know, servile 
kind of fear or you know, the idea of fear of like we would a ghost or something like that. But fear of the Lord is profound respect for the majesty, the awe of God. That's the idea. God is God. And we're just little creatures. It's like that fundamental relationship. That God is God. We're little creatures. We're called to know, love, and serve God. So that's a gift to recognize God is God in our lives. So oftentimes, see, we have to be careful. So oftentimes, in our human weakness, we want to invert it, right? We want to play God. You know, I'm God. I'll do my will. I'll make my commandments. Oh, sure, we think about God. You know, oh, God's, God's there. You know, Christmas and Easter, God, whatever. But do we really revere God as we should? That's the idea of the fear of the Lord. Always remembering God is God in our life. And God is number one, first priority, and we're called to know, love, and serve God. With all of our talents, our abilities, we give glory to God. And with that then comes piety. Piety is remembering we're just the humble servants. In a way, that's piety. Piety is having those good devotions. Piety is expressing our love through our prayer, through our worship, especially at Mass. Piety is even doing those little simple things. Like when I was a child, I remember you know, being taught to like kiss the crucifix, for instance. And we do that at Good Friday. That's a pious action. Yes, we, we know that that's a physical object, but in our spiritual way, we are piously reverencing Christ who died on the cross. Or the idea of making the sign of the cross with holy water when we come into church. Genuflecting, that's all piety. It's again, humbling ourselves before God. It's having that pious devotion. It's also recognizing Everything we have comes from God. You know, again, we're just the creature. The little simple creature. Yes, God loves us. We're a child of God. We're just a little creature. That's piety. So, and then with that disposition, see, comes knowledge. So knowledge is that gift by which we can learn the faith. So we ought to pray to the Holy Spirit to know the faith. But also to know it in a way that we can know what is of God. Like if a person is really in love with God, devout, and so on, that person sort of knows if something doesn't sound right. You know, it's like if you really know any subject pretty well, and somebody says something, you might say, well, that doesn't sound right, because you know it well. Same thing with faith. Like even though we might not have, you know, the huge degree in theology or something, if we love God enough and we know the basics of faith and someone says, well, you know, it's okay to steal in this case or something like that, say, well, that doesn't sound right. That's knowledge. You know. It's almost, so it's, yes, being able to know the faith, to continue to study the faith, but also to know the things of God. And with that, then comes understanding. Like, it's one thing to, let's say, know the Ten Commandments, be able to recite them in order, but it's another thing to understand them. What do they mean? What's the spirit of those Ten Commandments? That's a great gift, too. And it's something that grows. Or it's one thing to say, well, the Holy Trinity is... One God, three divine persons. But understanding is deeper. And sometimes that understanding is beyond words. But that's a gift of the Holy Spirit. And we grow in that understanding. The more we, given the basic disposition, the more we strive for the knowledge, the more the understanding will come. And also, too, given that, it's understanding God's will. What does God want? for my life, understanding his will. What does he want me to do? What's the right, or what is the direction of my life? That idea of understanding. But then, too, comes counsel. And counsel is that gift 
whereby we can know and distinguish what is right from wrong, what is good from evil, for ourselves as we make our own moral decisions, but then two, to guide others. If someone comes up to you and says, you know, I'm in this dilemma, what should I do? Well, hopefully, because of the knowledge, the understanding, and with counsel, a person can give a pretty good answer. You know, you ought to do this. This is what is right in the eyes of God. This is what you should do. This is the good action to take. That's counsel. How important that is. Especially in our world today, so many people are confused. And because of perhaps the moral relativism that we live in, some people really don't know right from wrong. They don't know truth from falsehood, good from evil. They get into these dilemmas. And what do we say? Well, do whatever you want to do. That's not a Christian way to respond. No, we say, this is what's right in the eyes of God. This is what is true and good. This is what's going to lead to joy. That's important. Not just saying, well, do whatever you think's best. No, people can make some pretty bad mistakes doing that. So the gift of counsel, very important. But then all of this is building to wisdom. And wisdom's that deepest knowledge of God. It doesn't necessarily mean, again, academic degree kind of wisdom. It really comes from lived life with God. It's, as St. Paul would say, thinking with the mind of Christ. It's sort of like spouses. You know, after you've lived with each other for a while, you sort of know what the other one's thinking. Yes? No? Yeah, you do. You do, right? You know what the other one's thinking, right? That comes from love. Lived life in love. It does. Well, that's exactly what wisdom is. It comes from lived life, love with God. We think with the mind of Christ. That's what St. Paul said. And then fortitude is that strength to live it. So fortitude could be the strength to live our faith in the face of persecution. It could be just to endure hardships, sufferings. It can be to be strong even in times of doubt. And we all go through those periods too. Doubt, trial temptation. That's fortitude. So these seven gifts are so important. I think too that we haven't emphasized these enough in the church. I'm not sure why, but we really haven't emphasized how important these are. But more and more as maybe as I get older or something like that, more and more the idea of praying for these gifts Praying for the help of the Holy Spirit is so important, really. Like, and I can honestly, and I will tell you truly, that like in preaching, that I pray to the Holy Spirit as I prepare sermons, but also even before I preach. I'll say, like you see a priest bow before the altar and say a prayer as they're doing the Alleluia verse and so on. I say a prayer to the Holy Spirit. And that's important. And the Holy Spirit gives us those graces that are needed. Yes? One of the oldest um, novenas in the church is the uh, novena to the Holy Spirit. And it's the ten days leading up to Pentecost. Mm -hmm. And each day you pray for a different gift of the Holy Spirit. Do you know when that originated? I don't know. All I know is that it, was, it originated very early on. Very, very early. Now, yeah. It's my understanding it's the oldest novena in the church. Oh. Find out more. Okay. There's your homework. I didn't know that. Now, huh? There is, is there? There's something in the gift shop about it? About the oldest novena? About the novena, there's a book on the novena of the Holy Spirit. I bet we could work out a gift shop. Probably, gosh. Well, there you go. So, now when you think about these gifts, though, you think about Pentecost when the, whole, when the apostles were there and the Holy Spirit descended upon them. And the Holy Spirit came with these tongues of fire and this driving force of wind. Well, those are the gifts. And the gifts just um, inflamed them with this love, this passion to go out and preach the gospel. So very important gifts. Now, 
Okay, any questions at all? You all are very quiet tonight, extremely. Well, then that's it, gang. And again, next week, read chapter 6 of St. John's Gospel. And that will enable us to maybe move a little bit more quickly, not to water anything down, but just to move a little more quickly on that so that we can cover maybe two classes in one, hopefully. We'll see. All right? Maybe not. Probably not. But we'll see. Okay, good. We'll see you next week then.